Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the first EMEA V Brown Bag for a few weeks. Uh, we've had a short hiatus. Uh, um, things have been a little bit crazy work-wise for uh, I think both, both Greg and myself and we've been a little bit lax about uh, getting some of these organized. Um, quite fortunately uh, this evening we have Mike Foley from VMware uh, who will be uh, giving us a, a wonderful presentation on um, uh, his uh, related to his security white, white paper that was released earlier in the year uh, all around uh, VMware hypervisor security. Um, so uh, I probably won't dilly dally too much more and um, hand over to Mike. All right. Well, uh, as I said in uh, in the private chat, uh, I haven't done one of the brown bags, and I haven't listened to a brown bag in quite a while. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll have to wing this along and see how it goes. So I, I'm making it up as well. <laughs> well, good, good. Good, so we take the blade guards off and off we go. <clears throat> Let me just uh, change this to uh, kiosk or uh, individual window mode, a little easier to, for everyone to view. Um, hopefully everyone can see that just fine. It's looking good to me at the moment. I'll just hide all the other stuff that's in the background, like the hardening guide I'm working on and a ESXi build and so forth. There we go. So hopefully uh, the only screen is uh, the one where I'm showing my slides. Uh, yeah, I can just see some of the rest of the desktop as well, but um, yeah, that, that's not a problem. Oh, okay. You should right. be able to share just so, your uh, PowerPoint if you want to, but... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, let me just do that then. Uh, it's just the main screen. Looks like I can only just change to main screen, so we'll just leave yeah, it at right. that. That's all right. So, um, yeah. I, first, let me thank you all for, for having me on the V Brown Bag. And my name is Mike Foley. I work in uh, technical marketing at, uh, at VMware. Uh, the same place uh, that produced such luminaries as uh, Duncan Epping, Frank Deniman, uh, Alan Renouf, and um, William Lamb. And so and I guess I'm the, the next wave because they all left after I joined. And I focus primarily on vSphere platform security. And everyone uh, starts when they say that, well, what do you mean by platform security? It's, it's ESXi and vCenter. It's not vShield. It's not network security. There's actually a whole other business unit that is dedicated just to network security. And those are the folks that deal with things like NSX and vCNS, the product formerly known as vShield. I'm focusing primarily on hypervisor, vCenter, and all of that, uh, that, that stuff and trying to get folks to understand that the virtual infrastructure is the same as your physical infrastructure and should be in many respects treated the same, but that there's unique capabilities of the virtual infrastructure uh, that could then be turned around and used uh, for better security moving forward. Sorry, had to let the cat out before he started getting annoying. And the joys of working at home. So what I uh, this is a slide deck that I built for the Varro Madness uh, event a couple of weeks ago. And I talk about uh, the new ESXi security white paper, uh, a little bit about uh, ESXi security architecture and design. Um, things like operational security. There's what what I'm finding as I'm talking to to more and more customers is that we need to do better on operational security and the costs around that. Uh, that uh, making a, a what is what could be perceived by one person as a small change can be perceived as by a larger organization as a very costly change. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit more. 
Uh, then in number four, I'll talk a little bit about the, the vSphere hardening guide. Um, someone reached out to me before this uh, with, with some questions around that. Uh, right now, at this moment, I'm actually working on the 5.5 update one version of the hardening guide. And then we'll talk a little bit about best practices and, and takeaways from from this particular deck. I really don't want this to be a, a death by PowerPoint. Uh, if anyone else is, uh, if it, so we've got 11 out of 101 attendees. Please send your questions in chat. Let me make sure that the window's nice and open. Yeah, so please send your questions in chat. Uh, you don't want to just listen to me the whole time. So, when I first got to VMware, um, my primary task was to get the vSphere 5.1 hardening guide out. I joined VMware in January 2013. And then the second major project was to revamp, rewrite the old 2007 era uh, security white paper that had done a great job but was missing a lot of updated content. And so that's really why I, I started writing the white paper. Uh, you know, the, the whole virtual infrastructure market is starting to mature. Uh, it's no longer hidden within the data center. Originally, the big impetus, the big thing that got VMware started was an IT guy would see VMware in action go, wow, that's really cool. I can run a whole bunch of VMs on one box. And then they'd just go do it with no real regard for, um, you know, uh, how do I build out a virtual infrastructure? It was, let me get it. I'll worry about all that sort of stuff later. But now that it is underpinning a large number of customers, now you're starting to run compliance and regulatory workloads on there. It's becoming more and more critical. And that goes back to the virtual infrastructure is maturing. Um, it's now starting to come under uh, a lot more scrutiny. So now you've got the security guy going in, and he's saying, I'm not sure I trust the hypervisor. And he has a whole bunch of concerns that need to be addressed, but also the white paper uh, I took on the white paper as to be mostly consumed by the security guy. Uh, for a, a new person who's a uh, new IT guy who's getting into virtualization, it's a great resource. But the primary focus was when the security guy walks into IT and says, I don't trust the hypervisor, what about this, what about that? This is the paper you hand the security guy and say, go read this, come back and let's have an informed discussion because this will bring you up to speed enough that we can now start to talk about security uh, rather than me trying to, uh, you know, educate you on the fly. That really, it, it just doesn't work. And then finally, the, the, one of the big things is there's an awful lot of FUD to counter. Now, FUD is an acronym for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And there's an awful lot of information that goes out uh, at a number of different security conferences around hypervisor security. A lot of stuff gets rehashed over and over again so that people can get a session and get up on stage, get a whole bunch of people going, oh my gosh, and bringing fear, uncertainty, and doubt into the conversation when, in fact, really the fear, uncertainty, and doubt really should be focused on something else. And I'll go into a little more detail there. So as I said, IT has now started to come, uh, uh, virtualization has now started to come under the security radar. You can't hide anymore. It's, it's just not going to happen. Um, there's far too much stuff going on that you can't just kind of hand wave away uh, security from understanding what's going on at the virtual infrastructure layer. There's, it's an infrastructure they really do need to know uh, and, and need to understand 
um, where to be focusing their concerns. So as you can see, over 500,000 customers are running VMware. 99% of the Fortune uh, 500 and Fortune 1000, um, all of these stats that are coming up, these are uh, VMware, the virtual infrastructure is trusted by these security teams. So there's no real reason it shouldn't be trusted by your, not trusted by your security team. So when you start to compile a list of, well, how can I convince the security guy that it's safe to run? You can start to point them at some of you know the largest customers, largest organizations or businesses in the world are, are running their infrastructure on top of VMware. Unfortunately, as I alluded to the fact, IT and security silos are not going away anytime soon. It's just the way it is. So as we start to have that conversation with the security guy, we really need to understand what, where some of his primary drivers are. Obviously, it's I want to make things more secure. But one of the biggest drivers for security, and you know, some are welcome to argue against this, and please throw them up in chat or in the questions, um, is compliance. I need to be compliant with PCI, or I need to be compliant with, in the, in the US, HIPAA. I need to be compliant with uh, banking regulations, whichever uh, banking re regulations uh, you, you may need. A lot of the drivers around security are coming through compliance. Um, a lot of the drivers around security are coming through audits. It's, there's an awful lot of time, energy, and a huge amount of money that are driving these, these regulations down all the way into the virtual infrastructure. And unfortunately, I think those drivers tend to take people's eye off of um, the ball. You know, compliance doesn't necessarily equal secure. Security shouldn't be a checkbox. Have I checked all the boxes on, have I checked all the PCI boxes on Monday, but I get broken into on Tuesday? But I checked all the boxes. Doesn't necessarily mean you're, it's going to save your bacon uh, on, on Tuesday. Now, when it comes to securing the infrastructure, unfortunately, a lot of people start with a firewall, add in some antivirus, include some VLANs for isolation, and then that's it. Because compliance didn't ask for anything more than that in some cases, uh, but that really doesn't address a lot of uh, insider information. Firewalls by nature, uh, ever since the Great Wall of China, have been defensive in nature and porous. There's always holes in firewalls. Uh, one of the biggest being, you know, HTTPS. Um, antivirus is in, in, in my opinion, a, uh, a battle that succeeds from time to time, but it's a war that is, we're losing. It, it, there's just, there's so many people out there whose main goal in life is to get that virus onto your system. It's a, it's a, it's a real knockdown drag out battle. And you know VLANs uh, can help with isolation, but they shouldn't be just the only story. So when it comes to security architecture and design, isolating things from affecting other things is really the name of the game. So uh, it, what I what I have found. Uh, in the, in the many years that I've been dealing with virtual security is that the defense in depth story is becoming more and more and more critical. You have to have these layers of isolation, each one being able to protect the layer on, uh, above. So that if one layer is broken, there's another layer to, to help mitigate the threat. 
So does the hypervisor, i.e. software, provide VM isolation? The big question that I get from a lot of security folks is <clears throat> what about virtual machine escape? Uh, the, the ability of a virtual ma machine to compromise another virtual machine or to compromise the hypervisor. Now the old white paper that was written in the late 2000s, back then an awful lot of the hypervisor was software. But what has happened since, say, 2007, 2008, is an awful lot of the virtualization primitives of, of isolation have been pushed down into hardware. At VMworld last year, I asked this question, a multiple choice question, how many believe that hypervisor isolation is done in software or in hardware, and the vast majority said in software. Well, it's actually done within hardware. Modern CPU technology handles that isolation. The uh, Intel VT or AMD V, AMD dash V uh, hypervisor extensions, they handle that CPU isolation so that a virtual machine can't send instructions to another virtual machine. That just, it, it can't happen. So instruction isolation is done at the CPU. Memory translation and remapping, including DMA access, that's all handled at the CPU. I.O. mapping, being able to say, uh, I, need to access, I, I need to send data down to a particular device. All of that isolation is all managed at the CPU level. And then a address translation for CPU and devices, that's all managed at the CPU level. So where does the hypervisor come into play? The hypervisor with all of this functionality, uh, the hypervisor is really the management interface into these virtualization primitives. It is, it is the part that allows you to create the roles so that uh, user A cannot do something against user B within the hypervisor. Uh, it, uh, it is the, the part that sets up the virtual machine, allocating the memory, uh, allocating the devices, saying, okay, this virtual machine has access to this, ser this amount of memory and, and this type of uh, CPU stepping, so on and so forth. That's the software part. But the actual isolation between instructions and memory and I.O., that's all handled at the CPU level. So here we see um, a, a graphic that I created for the white paper where we're showing the physical ring zero and then the virtualized privilege levels. And you will see that virtual machines don't have access to a physical ring zero. It, it, it's just, it doesn't happen. Sorry, I had to take a drink. Um, all of those ring zero um, requests are trapped and then dealt with by the hypervisor leveraging CPU stuff. And that's all called out in the white paper. Same with, with memory isolation. That, as I had gone over, is called out in the white paper. And all of the, the isolation and you know what blocks of memory does a virtual machine have? And can I share those blocks of memory? No, you can't. That's, that's isolated. Um, <clears throat> that's isolated at the, the, the CPU level. So uh, here's a, a, a slide uh, from a couple of years ago, that, but I've, I've updated a little bit. Uh, memory protection at the hypervisor level, we leverage NXXD and ASLR, randomizing where kernel modules are loaded into memory, uh, marking writable areas of memory as non-executable. That's all handled by the hypervisor. We do have uh, digital signing of the VIBs, the, the, uh, the, the the containers upon which drivers uh, are distributed on the on, on the media on, in the ISO uh, and on the hypervisor, <clears throat> um, the drivers themselves are not signed. The containers on which you get the drivers are signed. That's that's how it uh, it works today. That goes. In, we go into a, a fair amount of detail in the white paper on that. Uh, ESXi does have the capability of leveraging TPM and uh, Intel's TXT 
to ensure that the image that it booted off of <clears throat> has not been tampered since its last reboot. My personal thing around uh, TPM and TXT is when you have a server that might be up for a year, you may or may not, that may or may not be as important if, unless you can, unless you can test those values periodically while, while that kernel is running, that one-time value I took in March 2013 uh, may not be relative in March 2014. So uh, that's, that's a, a more of a personal opinion, but you know, the capability is there. Now for 5.5, we put in a 5.1, I believe, we put in a new firewall engine. We uh, allowed uh, Active Directory authentication. That's covered within the white paper. And the ability to do syslog over an SSL connection. That was a, a big requirement from, another, uh, from a number of com uh, companies. <clears throat> so guests only see what they're allocated. You can't assign a, a, a virtual machine. It's one of the questions security guys come up with is, well, what if, that, what if that virtual machine comes up and it takes over another virtual machine's disk? The physical uh, analog to that is I have two physical servers side by side. In order for server A to take over server B's disk, someone actually has to pull it out and push it into server B. You, it, the, same, the same rules apply here. Someone actually has to make a conscious effort to assign a virtual disk to a virtual machine. Now, all of us IT folks that are on, on the line, we're all going, well, yeah, of course. That's just how it works. But remember, the white paper was written really more for the security guy to help him understand it just doesn't work that way. You you can't just uh, you ha someone actually has to make a conscious effort in order to either uh, remove a disk and, and mount it on another virtual machine or mount that vir that that virtual disk on two machines. It that's just the way it works. So one of the parts of the white paper that I worked with Duncan on. Uh, was around resource provisioning, shares, and limits, and how they affect security. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of folks are bring up the the noisy neighbor sort of uh, scenario, where a virtual machine will will be attacked, um, causing a denial of service attack on that virtual machine. And the worry is is that that denial of service on that one virtual machine will grab resources away from other virtual machines. Really doesn't work that way. Um, so one of the things we, we talk about around provisioning is you know the the guy who comes up and says, well my SQL server runs with eight eight CPUs or or uh, eight cores, uh, uh, two four core CPUs and uh, 16 gig of memory. That's what I want on my on my virtual machine. Not really understanding that resources are shared within a within a virtual environment, and that by over provisioning a virtual machine, it will end up getting more shares than others, even if they're not being used effectively. So the thing is, I say that's an apples versus oranges discussion. And I had this discussion uh, in my previous job with an engineering team where they wanted to assign their virtual machine with eight virtual CPUs and uh, eight gig of memory. And I said, well, how do you know it needs eight? Well, that's what the hardware comes with. So I made them do a test of testing with one virtual CPU, two virtual CPUs, four virtual CPUs, and eight virtual CPUs. And come to find out, the application ran just as fast, if not faster, on two virtual CPUs than it did on four. And only slightly less performance on one virtual CPU. And they said, well, it needs 8 gig of memory. And I said, well, yeah, but you're running on Windows 2003 32-bit. Um, you're never going to see that 8 gig of memory. So we knocked that down to 3.5. And, and the system ran 
within one to two percentage points of native speed on the same exact box. So don't over provision. Um, uh, limit that 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 ability for a virtual machine to grab too many resources. Now that said, grouping like virtual machines together in resource pools is a good thing to do from a security standpoint. So web servers in the web pools, database servers in the database pools, so forth. No one VM in a pool will use any more than any other virtual machine in the pool. So if you have say a bunch of web servers in the web pool and one of them gets a denial of service attack all the other web servers will get an equal share of the resources within that pool that one virtual machine will not take up all the resources of the pool so from a security standpoint that helps deal with that noisy neighbor issue um, one of the other questions that come up is the use of limits. And this is directly from Duncan. They're more hassle than they're worth from an operational standpoint. They can have detrimental operational effects if used improperly. Stick with resource pools. Um, <clears throat> we actually talked about um, a scenario oh, about a year or so ago of where limits could be used from a security standpoint. But it's really, it, it was really an, an outside edge case uh, that would work in theory, but no one's actually sat down and figured out. And that's where uh, I'm monitoring a virtual machine that is under attack, and I want to slow down the amount of, re uh, I want to slow that machine down so that I can be assured that I'm grabbing every bit of content out of that machine from a forensics, a live forensic standpoint. That's where limits would come into effect, where I could limit that virtual machine to a uh, to using less amounts of CPU and therefore slowing the machine down. But really, that's an edge case that is outside the scope of of day to day IT operations. Now we talk uh, a lot about uh, network isolation, and I can't tell you how many customers I run into that are running their vSphere infrastructure networks, so their VM kernel networks, are on the same network as their virtual machine networks. So that a virtual machine, if it is compromised, could easily then turn around and start to attack the, you know, the, the management login of the ESXi server. Isolate them. They should not be on the same network. Um, there's with, with all the new functionality we've been adding over the past number of years, what you're really starting to find is we're coming up with all of these other networks that need to be addressed uh, from an isolation standpoint. So you have things like your vMotion network. You have your vSAN network. You have uh, <clears throat> NFS storage or fault tolerance. Each one of those really should be isolated from each other. Now, whether you choose to use VLAN isolation for that functionality or uh, physical isolation for that, that's really going to be your call. But the real big thing is separating the ability of the virtual machines from being able to see what would be considered the management network that allows uh, the management plane, uh, if you will, of the virtual infrastructure. That is the real key separation that you should be taking away from this particular slide. So for the, the, the security guys, network isolation at a vSwitch level. Can a VM on switch one see a VM on switch two? In this particular example, no it can't. That virtual, that virtual switch one is tied to a particular physical host that I would assume would be on a separate network. That uh, virtual device on the VM is plugged into that virtual switch. That vir virtual network controller is plugged into that virtual switch. It can only see traffic on that virtual switch and whatever that, that physical um, uh, NIC is connected to. Now, if you look at VM2 and VM3, in VM, 
in VM3, there are two virtual net, uh, network controllers, both tied to virtual switch 2 and virtual switch 3. That means that VM2 can see VM3 and anything that is on virtual switch 3, if that makes sense. So really, it's about proper isolation of your virtual machines is what you, what you really want to be having um, is you know, an architectural level discussion of laying everything out. One of the things you, you take in the, in the, when you're going for your VCP, one of the things they tell you in the class, the install and config class is uh, plan, 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 then create VMs not create VMs and then go plan, plan, plan. It's the same with all of this, is if, when you're thinking about security, is plan everything out before you start implementing. Here's a, a kind of a laundry list of VLANs and vSwitches. Uh, one of the, the, the concerns that was brought forward was spanning tree attacks, VLAN hopping, so on and so forth. As you can see, there's a number of different uh, things in, in this slide, MAC flooding, uh, double encapsulation, multicast brute force, spanning tree, random frame attacks. They just don't happen on a virtual switch due to the design. Read into the white paper for why. The question that, that came to me recently was VLAN hopping. Well, in a, in a physical VLAN, the VLAN number is embedded in, in, the, in the packet. In, the virtual switches, the VLAN number is not in, it, it, well, native VLAN is not used, and the VLAN number is not in the data. So you can't mung with the data. It's, a, it's kind of a, a, a separate um, uh, piece. Uh, back to virtualized storage, uh, you know, can a VM mount another VM? Um, we show here. The, the different um, uh, connections that that go through that a virtual machine from an OS from the their VMDK OS disk can go through to get to the physical uh, um, array or or NAS. One of the concerns a security guy brought up was can can a virtual machine can I boot up a virtual machine and scan the VMDK and recover data from a previous virtual machine? Good luck. Um, virtual machine data is zeroed out, so you really can't do that. Um, it, 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 it just doesn't work that way. The other question was, can a virtual machine access the fiber channel? Not unless you actually add a fiber channel device and, and use direct path or some other sort of thing. You can't do that. Virtual machines only see what the devices that are presented to them. So in the case of a virtual machine, uh, it's only seeing the, the virtual SCSI adapter and virtual SCSI disk that is presented to them. Underneath, uh, at the virtual disk layer and storage library, is where it splits out into things like SCSI or NFS. And how that happens um, is, is shown here in this particular graphic. So one of my favorite slides, sexy versus boring. Now, we talked earlier about fear, uncertainty, and doubt. One of the big things that keeps coming up over and over and over and over again, I think I said over enough, is uh, a security guy goes to, say, the RSA conference. He sees a session on virtual machine escape, comes home in a panic, and starts worrying about the virtual infrastructure and VMs escaping out and doing bad things. Uh, in this chart, I'm showing a probability versus cost. Now, because we are talking about, at many uh, levels, uh, software, and software is written by humans, and humans are prone to, do, uh, to make mistakes, I can't say with a 
uh, probability uh, that a virtual machine escape will never happen. I will say that it hasn't happened in, in an extremely long time, only under very isolated, controlled conditions, and usually with someone else's hypervisor. That's one of the things you'll, if you do attend one of these sessions, is um, they will say something like, we were using you know, VMware Workstation 2.0. Yeah, but we're up at 10. Uh, or we were using you know, some really ancient version of, of VMware, and we, on, a, on a blue Tuesday with a red moon, we kind of, sort of, maybe not sure if we really did break out. But then they'll say, but when we use KVM and use Hyper-V or, or, or KVM and Zen, I should say, um, you know, we took advantage of a particular known bug and, and broke out. But what they really don't tell you is in almost every single case, anything like that was done by someone with full administrative privileges. So really, what's the bigger worry? The bigger worry is compromising the admin. Because if you are an admin at the ESX level, at the vCenter level, you can make bad things happen. And the security guys spend an awful lot of energy and time and worry over something that has a very low probability. And in order to possibly make it happen would take nation state dollars. I mean, we're talking like a very focused Stuxnet level type of, of uh, attack versus I'll just compromise the admin, get his credentials and log in, and then I own the virtual infrastructure. Um, one of the stories I tell back uh, when I was working at Digital many years ago, uh, a lot of us engineers were getting frustrated with the uh, security guard at the front desk just waving people through no matter what they showed. People would show their driver's license, for example, he'd just wave them through. So we had a contest that went around and said who could get past the security guard with the most bizarre object. And the guy who won was the guy who showed a can of tuna fish. So if I can get past your front door by showing a can of tuna fish, sit in a cube, plug in my laptop, scan for all ESX servers because they're not isolated because you keep them on the on the building LAN. And I compromise I've compromised an admin, I've got his credentials. I can own you. I can own your virtual infrastructure. So in that particular case, the probability is extremely high and the cost is very, very low. <clears throat> so Operational security costs and benefits. Um, one of the things that, uh, that that Grace Hopper said was, uh, you know, this is the way it, this is the way we've always done it uh, is wrong. So when I hear an answer of, well, this is the way we've always done it, that could be both wrong and very expensive to the business. Doing things much more efficiently and at scale is really the key to virtualization. That means you need to do security at scale. You need to consider how can I apply security in a consistent, verifiable, at a, a testable manner. Automation is your, is your key to an awful lot of this. So for example, you see a little bit of PowerShell here, um, or bogus PowerShell, I should say. For every host and a list of hosts, Say, for example, uh, set your uh, NTP address to a particular value. Why log into 100 ESX hosts and make the change manually when in a couple of lines of code I can ensure, ensure that all ESX hosts have been updated? The same goes for virtual machines. So for every virtual machine in my list of virtual machines, um, set the uh, enable copy paste advanced setting to be false. It's these types of things that can really help to uh, uh, bring consistency using IT tools 
and then being able to output that information to the security guy for him to pull into his tools to be able to say, yeah, we are in compliance with a particular setting across all of our virtual machines. That's really the beauty of automation is that ability to do things consistently. And doing things consistently allows you to find the, the, the bad things that are, that are inconsistent. Here's something that I'm, I'm hoping to explore more this year is being able to leverage things like uh, VCAC and v v VMware Orchestrator to provide, uh, to limit the scope of vulnerability. Why should I give the guy on the web team access to vCenter to create uh, virtual machines for his, um, for his, his web farm when he may, if I give him full admin access, I may, and I don't use role-based access control, I, I've just opened up another channel into vCenter where bad things can happen. What would probably be better, and I actually had this example from a customer recently, is they wanted to be able to allow their admins to do their job, but they didn't want to allow the admins to delete any virtual machines. So I suggested what they could do is really the better place for applying this type of workflow is not in vCenter. It's in an abstraction layer above vCenter, which would be Orchestrator and VCAC. So within VCAC, there's already a pre-approval workflow. Um, the, the, you would remove the right of deletion for virtual machines from all admins, create a role of full admin minus delete VM, create a workflow in VCAC that they would then log into to, to delete VMs. They would select the appropriate VMs, hit delete. It would then run in, uh, a workflow to get uh, an additional permission level from someone to review and approve. And then the, v the VCO workflow would then run to delete the virtual machines. His, his eyes lit up and said, we can do that today? And I said, yeah, it's going to take a little bit of work, but yeah, you could do that today. What that does is it now protects him from the rogue admin who maybe is very disgruntled, he's about to lose his job, and he goes off and he selects all VMs and hits delete. This has happened before. When you have full administrator rights, you can not only do very powerful things, you can do very bad things at scale. We all know this girl. She's the girl from, uh, from Jurassic Park. Here's her famous line. It's a Unix system. I know this. Why am I putting this up? Because a lot of, a lot of people look at ESXi, see a bash-like shell, and immediately assume that it's Linux underneath. It's something that we're, we, I constantly run into. Customers are constantly saying, yeah, but it's Linux underneath. No, it's really not. It has a lot of Linux-like features. Uh, the bash-like shell that's in ESXi is actually BusyBox. But it's not, it's not a Linux kernel. It shares similarities in design, but it's not a Linux kernel. Also, it also means that uh, it, it's a single user sort of uh, system. It is similar in layout to a single user Linux system such that everybody who logs in is root. And what you really use to control what people can and can't do at the ESXi level are the, v, uh, are, are the vSphere API roles and permissions. So going into vSphere, into ESXi, and applying Linux security controls may either break stuff or have absolutely no effect. And I go into detail in the white paper uh, about that. So that kind of wraps up the white paper. I'm going to touch on the, the hardening guide. Let me uh, bring up my questions that I got earlier. OK. So um, the vSphere hardening guide, with great power comes great responsibility. Everything rolls back to Spider-Man. Uh, what is the hardening guide? For the, uh, it, 
there's a lot of folks out there that use it. There's a lot of folks out there that don't even know it exists. It's a it's used by many as a checklist. It's a an Excel spreadsheet with um, a whole bunch of different settings that you can change change and a whole bunch of operational guidance. For the next major release of vSphere, I'm looking at actually separating out the operational stuff from the, the uh, what I would say, the programmatical stuff, you know, set this value to true or false, and decreasing the scope of the hardening guide and getting the hardening guide out of the operational business. That should really be all rolled into the documentation. Uh, so that's for a v.next. Uh, that's something I'm talking with people about right now. If you have any thoughts, any um, input on that, please reach out to me, mfoley at vmware.com. So in the hardening guide, there's a concept called risk profiles. Uh, security guys get a hold of the hardening guide. They walk into IT and say, go implement it. That means they're not really doing their job. Um, there's risk profiles. So risk profile one, use that if you're a three-letter agency, a government uh, entity, you have ultra-sensitive information you want to uh, protect. Uh, it closes all uh, perceived loopholes. Um, there are no actual, but there are perceived ones. Um, it could break stuff, and I'm trying to change that moving forward. Risk profile two, Use that if your environment falls under regulatory compliance, if you're an enterprise level. And risk profile three is you know, use in any or all environments. Uh, those are just good best practices. Please, please, please review this before implementing. If you implement something, you don't have to implement everything. These are guidelines. They are not mandates. They're not, well, VMware said I should. No, I'm telling you, I'm VMware in this particular case, I'm telling you to review those guidelines that apply to you and implement the ones that you feel will close a vulnerability. Applying security as a blanket is not how you really want to do this. So IT and security really should go over each of the guidelines and assess the risk to the business of each guideline. And as I said, these are guidelines. They are not mandates. Here's an example of uh, the hardening guide from our iPad app. Uh, we go through virtual machine, ESXi, network, vCenter, so on and so forth. An example might be uh, apply a, a guide. A, this is an operational guidance thing of applying ESXi patches. The requirement is stay up to date on your ESXi patches. Excuse me. If you're not up to date on your ESXi patches, get up to date on your ESXi patches. In 5.5, in the, uh, we introduced some updated vSphere uh, virtual appliances. So vCenter, uh, Login Site, a whole bunch of others, all are now built on a common uh, a core base. And within that common core base, there have been a whole bunch of security changes that were made to bring that common core operating system up to a defense department um, level of compliance of about between 91 and 95 percent, depending on the virtual appliance. Uh, within the virtual appliance, if you were a government organization, there is a, a script called DOD script for Department of Defense. Uh, what it does is it modifies things like password length, login banners, audit logging, so on and so forth. Um, you can change the login banners. You can change a couple of other settings. But this was a, a, a very easy way for our US federal government uh, uh, customers to be able to uh, make these virtual appliances compliant to de uh, specific Department of Defense uh, regulations. And uh, there's uh, the ability to do not only uh, system log forwarding, but a separate way of doing audit log forwarding so that only audit events will go to, uh, say, the security department and system events would go to an IT department. There is a four-part blog series on the vSphere blog. Look, uh, Search for my name on the vSphere blog, and you will see the four-part series that goes through 
uh, in uh, quite a deep level of detail as to all of these changes that were made to the virtual appliances. We try very hard, hard to design our stuff to the highest compliance uh, level. Uh, we are working on, uh, there's some new news coming out very shortly on common criteria. Keep uh, up to date on the common criteria blog on the VMware website. You'll be seeing more. One of the questions that I got, and it's addressed in the white paper, are the common criteria EAL levels. And these are transitioning to protection profiles uh, away from EAL. That may be of interest to you. Check out the Common Criteria Update blog for more info on that. So best practices, uh, key takeaways, review security practices. New infrastructure brings new key capabilities. It's time to use the tools. So as, we, uh, as I talked about earlier, uh, being able to leverage VMware Orchestrator and vCake for workflow approvals. Here's how that delete VM from admin role and replace it with a VCO action and then front end it with VCAC. Here's how that would work. The, the admin uh, logs into vCloud Automation Center, gets approval from a th uh, third party, maybe his boss or the security guy. The orchestrator workflow kicks off. The virtual machines are then deleted. This uh, protects the business from that rogue admin doing something either stupid or malicious. Uh, avoid rework. This is, um, this is a topic that I pulled out of a book called The Phoenix Project. If you want to see where the industry is moving around uh, the software-defined data center, uh, the whole DevOps movement, and then relate that to security, Read the Phoenix Project. It's by uh, Gene Kim, the former CTO of Tripwire. In that particular example, um, he, he talks about um, an assembly line. And I believe in, in this set of slides is, where did my return on investment go? So one of the examples that he talks about is uh, an, automo an automotive parts assembly line where he was seeing parts coming off the assembly line going off to another station and then there was a stack of the parts and there was one guy reworking each part. And he said, why is that going on? And he said, well, that's because the customer required uh, a change to the part. And what they were finding was that, that change to the part was very, very expensive, very time consuming and slowed down a lot of the operations. Now, if you think about that from the standpoint of creating a virtual machine template, do I create a virtual machine which takes six minutes for IT to provision and then goes to security who needs to apply security stuff and that takes six weeks to secure? I've just lost my return on investment of the capabilities of the virtual infrastructure. But if you do the security up front, you can retain that ROI. So IT and security work together to build a, a template that's secure out of the box. Now the IT guy can provision a virtual machine and retain that six minutes of IT to provision. What it also does from a security guy standpoint is it's now freed the security guy up to go focus on the stuff he really wants to focus, which is catching bad guys or, or um, ensuring that compliance is done properly. So by shifting where security is applied, you can retain that ROI over time. So as I keep trying to tell IT and security people, it's never too late to work together. Involving security up front um, will save the business an awful lot of money in the long term. So there's the, the link to the white paper, some Q&As. Uh, please uh, send your questions. Let me uh, look at uh, what um, someone had sent me earlier. Uh, one question that I had gotten from someone was, uh, how exactly do we come up with recommendations for the hardening guide? I would like to say we just make them up out of uh, you know, a whole cloth, but these uh, usually come from customer input. The hardening guide has been around for many, many years, has uh, gained an awful lot of content 
and I am going through that content and trying to reevaluate each of the settings to see whether or not they are still valid. In some cases, they are not, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to clean that up. Um, some, another question was design recommendations around security for VCD, VCDX applicants. Um, the current drafts really don't focus a whole lot on security, but it, it's really something that more time needs to be spent on. I'm going to reach out to uh, John Arashid to, to see what that content is today and what we can do to make that uh, better. Really, it's, it's designing around um, isolation, um, limited scope of vulnerability, I would say, would probably be the most interesting thing using the tool, the IT tools that are available today, but kind of putting on your security hat and using those IT tools uh, for the power of security. Uh, that, I think, would be um, a, a really interesting design recommendation if you were going uh, for your VCDX, is to take those tools that you're already having to use as part of your, your uh, VCDX um, uh, path and then kind of use a security slant on them. And another one that, that came in uh, was uh, what are the top three security pitfalls that should be avoided when putting together a, a design? I would say too many people with administrator access, not leveraging uh, role-based access control, um, proper seg uh, segregation or segmentation of the management plane from the user plane, that is the the network isolation of make sure your VMs are on a separate network than your, your VM kernel. And then uh, being able to use, as I said, other tools other than vCenter to limit the scope of vulnerability uh, and try to move the conversation away from the VM to VM or VM to hypervisor um, um, threats or, or perceived threats and more towards the, what I would consider the nexus of security, which is the, the VI admin and, and, and the scope of damage that can be done if that VI admin is compromised. It's much higher than um, you know, a VM to VM or VM to hypervisor type of, of thing. Any other questions? Certainly nothing's come up in the, uh, the chat or uh, on Twitter. Um, I have to say, <laughs> you've been very thorough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, secu security is one of those things where people go, oh, really? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's very much necessary, uh, I think. A, fr a friend of mine just uh, had, had posted on Twitter, I guess he's on the line, um, I'm going to start carrying around a can of tuna with me when I go to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Tuna fish, can of tuna fish, the uh, the, the the ultimate uh, uh, government ID. Brilliant, if any, with that easy. Everywhere. Yeah. Who needs passports, eh? Excellent. Any more questions for Mike at all? Uh, oh, there has to be one. Now, see, yeah. I, I run into this situation all the time with security folks. No, nobody, no security guy wants to be involved in a and a because no security guy wants to say, well, I'm doing it this way and have everyone in the room go, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Um, Frank's just asked so for a you, you can, download uh, link to the white paper, but we'll stick that in the show notes. That's not a problem. Yep. Yeah. You can say I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, I'm sure it should be. Um, excellent. No, I don't think there's anything else. No one else. No one else. No. no Sound no. good? Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I must admit. I, oh, thank you. I, 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 please, I, I send, never made, please send me the I, link. Uh, I will do, definitely, uh, once I've um, extracted it from wherever this is getting saved. But um, I must admit, I haven't made yeah. it all the way through the security white paper. Um, it's it's one of those things in a very large pile of things to read. <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, welcome to it's, my world. It's, 
Yeah, it's certainly been uh, interesting reading uh, so far anyway. Um, so uh, very much looking forward to um, yeah, having a look at the hardening guide when that gets updated as well for the next version of uh, vSphere. Um, yeah, there's yes. not a there's not a huge amount amount of changes, but uh, you know, um, I did post a, a, a blog article a little bit on the hardening guide uh, very recently, and uh, about you know why I drop some things from time to time. Yeah, and uh, it in that particular entry, I, I put in you know, I'm planning to drop. Um, I think it was disable data store browser, and I'm also yeah. looking at dropping. Uh, disable the mob browser, uh, managed object browser web page that's on an ESX and vCenter server. Um, because I think they break more things than they fix, and yeah. they're already protected by HTTPS, and they're not susceptible to some of the SSL vulnerabilities that are out there, so why delete them? You know? Indeed, indeed. Excellent. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Hope to have you back again sometime. All right. Uh, absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Thank you.